Today I want to talk about a class system. You know that thing that is supposed not to exist anymore? <laughs> well they got that wrong didn't they? But before I do that I just want to ask a couple of uh, questions or comments that have been passed. One, uh, to the person who finds my breathing uncomfortable to watch. And can I do anything about it? The answer is no. Uh, and uh, if I keep going with these videos, it will probably get worse. I mean, I could put on a, uh, on the oxygen mask, but it's full face and you wouldn't be able to hear a word I was saying which would probably make the day better for you but um, uh, for the sake of just this short period of time uh, making these I can do without it the second one is somebody noticed that I speak funny because my mouth is funny true um, there was an accident long ago, well, not that long, but it seems long ago, and uh, it's hollow. Nothing I can do about that. So I look like a toothless gundar, or whatever they call it these days, but it was actually something very different. I won't go into it, but I will say, give you a tip. If somebody behind you yells out, duck, don't turn around and say, what? <laughs> that was my error. Anyway, back on to today's. Class system ashore is one thing, but it's heavily mirroring the class system in ships. Even these one class ships that are all the rage now, you don't have first, second and third class anymore, it's all one class, but the cabins differentiate, did I say that right, uh, between the um, self-thought uh, importance of the people in them. Even within the class system of the officers themselves, it's there. Uh, deck officers are gentlemen pretending to be officers. Purses are officers pretending to be gentlemen. Engineers are neither pretending to be both. So wrong, well especially my soft spot are the engineers. They are the most highly trained people in the ship. Uh, no two ways about it. These fellows are brilliant. I mean, anybody can learn to drive a ship. I, I do it myself, so if I can do it, anybody can do it. So, back on to the subject. Two things, and one involves engineers. This is a true story. Um, the, there were some couples on board I think it was the Oriana not 100% they all blur after a while um, and they used to uh, during the day wander the deck, sit in lounges, play bridge, have a few drinks in the bar and they were getting most annoyed because this scruffy looking fellow in white overalls was coming up to them saying Good morning, good afternoon, how are you? Brilliant day. And they thought this was terrible, this scruffy looking urchin. Uh, how dare he yeah, make a point of speaking to them. What they didn't know was, until very much later, was that when he was out of those white overalls and not covered in dirt and grime, he had two and a half gold bars with purple in between on his shoulder. 
He was the uh, he was first venter, I think, or it could have been the uh, first propulsion. I don't know. First venter, pretty sure. And they'd been sitting on the table at dinner and chatting, and everybody was very happy. And they didn't know even then until he mentioned it uh, quite a few days in that he was the fellow that they'd been ignoring and being so rude to during the day. All image, isn't it? All image. Same person, one in white overalls, a worker going about his work, and the other one in his mess dress uniform hosting a table in the dining room. God help us all. Another one, it, it's a bit different, this, this is more of a funny story, but it came to mind and I thought I'd throw it in. Oh, must be at least 30 years ago now, 35. The ship I was usually with um, was in for repairs and it was going to be quite a long period of time. And I was asked if I could nurse uh, a passenger ship, a big one, through some pretty wild ports that they'd included in the cruise for Anzac Day. Port Moresby, Leigh, Rabaul, then Honiara, and back to Sydney. And that meant then that there were not just the Australian survivors, and their wives, but also a lot of Americans. Uh, arduous duties, it's not my favourite place in the world. I got both hepatitis and malaria up there, but there again, every expat that goes up there gets exactly the same, so there was nothing unusual about it. But at Lay, the ship actually comes alongside. It's quite a nice one, it's quite a nice little wharf apron. Crap town, but the wharf was very nice. And I had with me uh, two trucks full of palm leaves. The last minute they'd sent a radio saying, Could I get them palm leaves? And they thought they would have island night uh, between uh, um, Rabaul and Honiara. That's right. So I got them, well I didn't, but I arranged to have them, and I rounded up some the Sing Sing group they wanted, that's the ones that with the mud heads and all the rest of it. It was hot, uh, only about 98 the actual temperature, but the humidity was about 130,000%, it was terrible. and. I was acting as a port agent as I was there. I did the paperwork with customs and all that sort of stuff. Paid the usual bribes. Um, then I went on board to hand over some paperwork to the purser, an old, old friend from way back. <laughs> and I, yeah, that was the day of safari suits. And I was wearing one, you yeah, know, big white hunter out of the jungle. Very impressive. Uh, but mine was a real one, not one that you buy in a store in the city. It was, was the genuine article and covered with genuine perspiration from head to foot also. And with me, I had what looked like two very authentic New Guinea warriors. Um, Josh and the other one was David, I think. They were, they were actually university students from uh, the university in uh, Port Moresby. And uh, they spoke perfect English, of course. Both educated uh, the early part of their life in England. So the ship wanted to know if we could sort of give them any sort of a lift or do anything. That's why I organised for the mud men to come alongside Sing Sing groups, they call. And these two fierce warriors, I think Josh was 
studying theology, is that the right word, when you're going to be a vicar or a priest or whatever. And uh, David was studying uh, water management, you know, the infrastructure of building water supplies and places. But they had the whole white feathered headdress, the face paint, uh, bare tops except for some little bamboo thing they had. Uh, and they were actually, out of modesty, they were, they were wearing the usual codpiece type underwear, but they'd wrapped a little tiny bit about that long of uh, cow's hide, I think it was, around them. And they looked the part, and they both had spears, very pointy spears, which they got from the uh, university um, cultural centre, shall we call it. So we marched on board, and uh, I was heading to the bureau to head the, give the stuff over to the purser and have a very large drink, a very cold beer. And this little junior assistant purser comes up to me, came up to about there on me, a little, little tiny rabbit of a creature. And he said, are you the shore waller? And I didn't say a word, didn't say a word. So he repeated it and he said, I'm speaking to you, are you the shore waller? Ignored him again, don't speak to people like that, total idiot. So then he got very insistent and again said, if you're the shore waller, answer me man. And he poked me in the chest. Well, I didn't have any real choice, did I? Uh, I flattened him. Only took one blow, he was a little tiny creature. And Josh and uh, David, I'm sure it was David, they got into the act and got all fierce looking as if they were going to protect me and everybody backed away about 10 feet. <laughs> Just then Jim walked out um, uh, and he <laughs> looked down at <laughs> this purser, junior assistant purser who was just getting up holding some sort of a handkerchief to his nose, which wasn't broken. I didn't hit him that hard. And uh, tears running down his face, which it is. If you punch somebody just about there, um, it does make your eyes ward. So I thought there would probably be something, but everybody was laughing too much. Well, I'm talking about the ship's crew now. Passengers were aghast. They thought... Josh and David were going to spear them in the next few seconds. But they were laughing too, and within minutes the whole place had collapsed. Anyway, Josh and David, I, I went off, had to go and do the usual round, you know, Captain Deputy, Captain Chief Officer of Papers. And that takes a while because at each one, of course, you have a drink or two. And when I came back down to the foyer outside the bureau, Josh and David were there, and they had a ball. They'd been well fed, of course. Uh, they don't didn't drink, either one of them, but they had nice cold drinks. But they made a fortune. They didn't charge, or they didn't say they wanted money if people took their photograph. And as the more what should we say, the less timid of the women got to uh, closer and closer to them and they asked, can I take, have a photograph taken with you? Yeah, sure, you know. Or they said it in some sort of language they made up on the spot, I think. By the time I got back, they'd earned about $300, took in the two of them. They never charge people, but if people wanted to slip some money into their, what would you call it? <laughs> Not a belt, it's whatever holds the codpiece in place, I suppose. They were most happy. And even then, all that time ago, most, and it was all women, all women, or a couple of married couples. 
mainly been putting two dollar bills I mean a coin wouldn't stay there would it so two dollar bill was the oh no there was a one dollar bill but it was two dollar bills mainly so they had a fortune anyway when we walked through the ship to go back to the foyer uh, people stood aside and all the rest of it and we, we, it was hot and we were a bit of a mess and I heard oh terrible man and why do they let people like this on board and all the rest water off a duck's back we left the ship it sailed and it was heading for a bow I think could have been Moresby no was Rebel. And I was joining the ship there to come back to Australia via Honiara. Solomon Islands trading with the agents down there and they were pretty good. All mad as hatters of course. All the expats who stay too long in most places. Uh, they're all a bit, you know. So when I got on board and uh, Bernie got my baggage sent down to the cabin and it was late afternoon and uh, Johnny Miller came up and said oh you're on table 18 you'll like it they're a nice crowd and all the rest of it and the uh, when I got to the table they were there and I sat down and I introduced myself and one of these women with a sort of gorgon hairstyle said, You're that terrible sweaty man that we met in Bay. And I said, That's me. That's me. She said, Are you on a free trip? And I said, No, 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 no. I uh, do consulting work for this shipping company, but I have my own ship. Uh, I'm a master mariner, and it's being repaired in Sydney total change. I'd gone from that terrible sweaty man that they'd met in Lay to somebody who was almost on their own level. <laughs> Don't you love people like that? It's the same as sure. It really is. I mean the area we live in here is not very salubrious. Uh, it can get a bit a bit rough. We circle the wagons at night just to make sure everything's okay. Uh, and if you say to somebody from one of the better suburbs that you're from Harlexton, oh, ben, they look at you as if you just crawled out from under a rock. Luckily these days I don't have to. Just remember, please, People are people. Forget about money and all the rest of it. It's who they are. Even when I was a, a, a young lad in England, my family were, well, not top of the tree, but they were well. But Dad's friends weren't all retired colonels and admirals and all the rest of it. We had people come to the house for dinner who were, well, I remember the fellow I used to call Uncle John, he wasn't, he worked for the council, digging ditches. But he was a clever man, softly spoken, beautiful manners, beautiful. Um, those sort of people. And if, on the other side, I know I'm explaining this badly, it was a bad night. Um, the, shall we say, more upper class didn't like it. They were the ones that never got invited back again. So it was a happy household. Plus, of course, for certain times of the year, it was full of Gurkhas and Sikhs and... because my father was British Army in India. Uh, they made for interesting times as a, as a young lad. But I'm ranting on now. Society hasn't changed. The class
class is still there, but the class is with the neighbour, Nuva, Rich. They're the ones that are so far up themselves. They don't know what day of the week it is. Um, the real aristocrats um, are the nice people that open the door for a lady that say good morning, good afternoon. Can I help you with that shopping bag? You'd never pick them. Try and stay with the open-minded... What's the word I'm looking for? Real people. Take an interest in others, and others will take an interest in you. Well, I'll leave that for, for now. Uh, oh God, 21 minutes. And I can't even edit some of it out. Sorry about that. But I just wanted to make the point about the breathing and why I look a bit funny. That's why I have a beard too. It hides many sins from uh, that day. In the meantime, be nice to each other. And, uh, well, that's it. Be nice to each other. Cheers.